Oh, Denis, another mouthful. <laughs> What's up? Ladies and gentlemen, you have tuned in to Requiem for a Tuesday. And I'm Adam Pecora. You know what time it is. We're slurping them up again, baby. It's Denis, double feature. What a thrill. Excited for this one? Well, let's be honest. I'm a little torn on this one. Depending on how long this episode goes as I'm doing it, I kind of need this to be a short one. Schedule-wise, that was the plan anyway. We'll see. We'll see what happens. As you know, if I go long, I go long. I give the people what they need. You know what I'm saying? Uh, (laughs) But the NFL draft is on Thursday, and boy, am I fired up, and I just want to talk about it, and I have nobody to talk about it with, so this is my outlet. I speak to myself, but at least maybe somebody will listen to it. Uh, Thank you for listening to this episode. Listen to more, please. Uh, Rate the show. Review the show. Subscribe to the show. Uh, That's a big one. We're on Apple. We're on Spotify. Every major platform you can imagine, you can find me. (laughs) Please look for me. Uh, (laughs) You can follow me on Instagram at m.rfat. Merch, rfat.bigcartel.com. We got all the links right there in the description below for you. Click on them, see what we got. Take a gander. There's music as well. Uh, If you're just here for the giggles, I get it. But if you're not, Multiplex, Wolf X, uh, Microwave Minutes, Justice's Show, Season 4, 3, I can't keep track, debuting possibly today as of your listening if you're listening day of release uh but also certainly possibly not uh so you know look for it if you haven't listened to it at all though check it out fun show uh youtube if you can though that's that's a video show for the most part and uh i think it, i think it deserves it you know Some people tell me, like, ah, you should do video, and it's kind of like, why? Uh, I did one because I was in New York, brought the whole setup with me, thought that would be a fun little project. Uh, That was when I was using much lesser quality equipment as well, though. Uh, So attempting to do that again, which I would, don't get me wrong. Um, We tried again, if you're a listener of the show to do a second New York episode and we literally could not get the computer to have a screen. Uh, So the plan completely backfired and we had to lug a bunch of shit. Anyway, I don't even know why I'm going down that tangent. Point being, he does a video episode constantly. They're eating. It's fun. Editing. Whatever. It's a nightmare for me. Uh, so watch my one video episode on the RFAT YouTube, everything else, just this golden voice singing in your dreams. All right. First things first, look, I didn't really try to do like a deep dive onto either of these movies for the question I'm about to pose. I of course watched them both prisoners technically like three times cause I had some sleeping incidents uh how did he do this so prisoners debuts at tell you ride august 30th 2013 enemy premieres at tiff the toronto i believe that's toronto international film festival september 8th what These movies came out 10 days apart, and then I guess the theatrical release was only Canada, Spain, and France, which is odd. I don't know. I don't understand co-productions or why they matter, Um, but yeah, I guess this just didn't come out in the United States, which is shocking. Um, 
And it's the production was from May, started in May. So, I mean, my guess is prisoners, but they, I mean, 10 days apart or a week, whatever that is. I didn't do the math, actually. Nine days, whatever. <laughs> my guess is prisoners big studio picture comes out Warner Brothers U.S., had to have just been done first and it sat for a proper release date. Like maybe it was completed in February and he just goes right into enemy. That's logical. You know, thanks Adam. You really thought that one through, uh, you, you know, I mean, that does make sense, but it's just crazy to do these two movies back to back because they are both excellent and excellent for different reasons. Now, I'll get the nitpicks out of the way up front for prisoners. If you don't know, I'll give you the general plot line. Uh, on Thanksgiving, two children are kidnapped from a family. Uh, there was a van parked outside of their house, like up the street a little bit. The kids are outside playing on it. Somebody comes and grabs them. They're like, yo, don't fucking do that. Uh they go back out just to see, like, why is there just some van there? I think it was, like, in front of a house that they had known to be empty, so it was, like, extra sus. And then, whatever, the van's just gone. And they're like, oh, fuck, there was somebody in that van? Like, somebody was living in that thing, and they just watched our kids play all over it. Um, And then the kid, you know, whatever they they the kids go back in and eat. Then they go back out after eating. That's what it was. He was bringing them in to eat. They go back out after eating, and then they don't come home. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal is an ace detective. Hugh Jackman, the father of the children, who then kidnaps like an overtly mentally challenged autistic kid. Well, it's the guy who owned the van. I mean, it's not like it was just because. <laughs> it wasn't like it's got to be that guy. Uh, he was able, they were able to find the owner of the van. Uh, you know, the cops bring him in. They're like, yo, this this kid, this guy's like, m might be 30, but he's mentally like eight. So we don't think he, like planned an elaborate kidnapping and now is also expertly dodging all of our questioning. It just seems unlikely. Uh, Hugh Jackman is fixated that it has to be him, kidnaps him, throws him in a, like a property he inherited they loosely discuss at the beginning. Um, a lot of ums today. I apologize. You know, sometimes the bong rips too big before the episode starts. I'm I'm trying. I'm conscious of it. And that's a good first step. And you should appreciate my effort. <laughs> okay. Paul Dano, by the way, is the challenged man. <laughs> who, what is his name in it? Alex Jones, that's right, of course. I It's hard to take him seriously anytime they say his full name because I just keep thinking about how the frogs are turning gay and nobody's doing anything about it. And then, yeah, so he, he has him like locked up in the property, basically beats the shit out. He's just torturing him. He locks him up, just beats him, beats him, tortures him. He builds like a... Like a what, what was I going to say? What's the term? Waterboarding chamber type thing with both hot and cold water. And it's just completely like destroying this guy. Uh, it goes on for a long time. He ropes Terrence Howard into it. Oh, that's what it is. Sorry. It's not both of his kids. One of the girls was his daughter. The other was Terrence Howard's daughter. Uh, Viola Davis is Terrence Howard's wife. What just what a treat! Anytime you get to watch Viola Davis, just bang one out, uh, fantastic. Anywho, I think David Fincher should have directed this movie. It's just his wheelhouse. Now, that's probably why he's not interested 
or what well, I mean, you know what I mean. I don't even know if any of that was realistically in the cards. I'm just saying in an ideal world, this movie's directed by David Fincher. That's that's my hottest take. Um damn it. <laughs> and my second one is and th- this is pure speculation, but my instinct is that Denis wanted Oscar Isaac for Hugh Jackman's part and probably was denied because he wasn't a big enough star at the time. Or Oscar Isaac just wasn't a big enough star at the time and, you know, didn't have a chance regardless. But just given how off-used Oscar Isaac has been with, you know, And it just seems like he would nail the lines a lot better. It seems like you would believe all of it just a lot more. I don't know. He just seems like the perfect fit. Kind of seems like Hugh Jackman's just a bit out of place. His performance is good. It's just that it's Hugh Jackman. I, I understand that he's Wolverine, but this isn't that. He's believable as Wolverine. You know, I mean, he's just a like a a, a a musical, theatrical, grand, I don't know. It seems like he has to be in something more fantastical. And this is too gritty and grounded for this to be Hugh Jackman guy in Pennsylvania. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. But that's what I think. Um, so, fuck. God damn it. I'm a failure. Gyllenhaal, though, on the other hand, is absolutely dynamite. Uh, he's... And, not that that's difficult. They literally, in in one of the more egregious parts of the movie early on, they're like, you've never even lost a case, have you, Loki? And it's like, he's never... Or not solved. Like, he's solved every case he's ever gotten. Is that even possible? I just don't think so. Because why would he be working in rural Pennsylvania? Or, you know, like, still at this point. Because clearly that should mean he should move on to more complex crimes in different places. But... (sighs) That's the only thing. I don't know. That's just a little silly. That's my thing. His character is literally just like, I'm great. Like, I'm going to solve this. I'm going to figure it out, which he kind of really doesn't. They kind of just happen upon the solve, which is kind of the also the other weak part of the movie. But it doesn't really matter because every part of it is thrilling and entertaining. And that's the point. Uh, this isn't supposed to be some like massive twist reveal that shocks you. Um, or is like the, like the aha moment. It's not really that. It's more of just like, oh, the nightmare is right in front of you. Like this is all around, you know what I mean? Like you were just at this lady's house. You were sipping tea with her, like talking to her as a confidant. It's like, that's what this shit is. It, it wasn't supposed to be this like, oh, wh- what an elaborate crime, as they had said earlier. Like, they didn't think he was capable of it. It's not that elaborate. You know what I mean? It's it's really everything about this is harrowing and terrible, no matter what. There wasn't it didn't take some genius criminal. Now, this lady was a serial criminal mastermind. I mean, that is a thing. So I guess I am talking myself out of that point a little bit. Like she did have like a hole in the yard, but it wasn't that clever. It was under some car that had been sitting there and she was like, you want to buy it? Like she wasn't afraid about hiding nothing. And it was just a hole, I guess. You know what I mean? Anywho, (laughs) they get a lead because some creepy guy is running away from them. Uh, 
David Dasmalchian. Is that how you say that guy's name? Probably butchered his name, but you know the guy. Actually just watched Late Night with the Devil. That should definitely come up on a future episode down the line. We got a few slotted already, but that one's on the long list. Uh, Great flick, and he's awesome. A great slimy fucking creep, though, which he plays in this. And then they track down his house. It's The walls are just covered in crazy shit, and he's got trunks full of bloody children's clothes. And you're like, yeah, I believe that this guy kidnapped and murdered kids. And they cannot capture him. He takes a cop's gun, blows his brains out. Insane. This movie is as bleak as a movie gets. Shot by Roger Deakins. I I can't believe I went this far without mentioning also. Just what an ace. Incredible shots in this. He makes people talking in a room so interesting. All of a sudden, there's a traditional camera on Hugh Jackman and his wife. Then he puts something on the table and walks back over to her. But right as he sets it down, the camera becomes on the table where he set the thing down and is now watching him walk away as they talk to each other. And it's just still beautifully framed, symmetrical, whichever, you know, whatever the case may be. It's always just perfect. Unbelievable choices. Just what it, what it, what a, what a guy, what a genius. And people aren't grateful. That's what I've noticed. You tell someone, oh, this was shot by Roger Deakins. They don't care. People don't even notice. How do you not notice the shots? It's all about the shots. Oh, God damn it. What happens next? Let me think here. Right. Well, then after that is when they release Alex Jones from questioning. Uh, He tells Hugh Jackman tries to attack him as he's walking, like being escorted or whatever. Kind of like fucking uh, shit. The guy who killed. uh, Oh, I'm fucking dropping the ball right now. Darby, Darcy, whatever. I'm way off. Jack Ruby, the guy who killed Lee Harvey Oswald. He just ambushes him like that. And Alex Jones goes like, they only cried when I left. And obviously he's incensed by that. I don't, but the thing is like, Alex Jones is is a nincompoop. To, to put it lightly. So he doesn't under I think technically like he doesn't understand that that is like a super aggro thing to say that basically taunts him and confesses at the same time. I think technically that wasn't the intent. Uh, so then they do like a backstory thing about Alex Jones and like his creepy aunt and all this stuff. Um, she reveals that her kid had cancer and died. And so they adopted Alex Jones, who was, I think like, right. Their nephew. I just said that. (laughs) And then he has like a stuttering problem because of something with snakes. And then you're like, and then it's like, oh, there's the tie. That guy had snakes. What is that about? But I didn't, you know, I didn't connect that till after. I'm not going to act like that made sense or anything. And then they reveal that all the tests that come back from the crazy guy's house who shot himself where it was like fake blood. It was like animal blood or something. And the, the clothes, they like had record, like receipts or something. They like knew that he bought them at the store like that. Like not that like that they for sure did not belong to the kidnapped kids. And it's like, wait, what? Okay. Things are kind of starting to come together here. And then they show the daughter's escape. Well, one of them escapes, the other one does not get away, and it's Forrest Whitaker's daughter. 
and she's like heavily drugged and like shaken up obviously so she can't really speak but she just goes like you were there and then they run out oh she says that to Hugh Jackman That's right. She says that to Hugh Jackman, and then he sprints out. And Loki, which is Gyllenhaal, chases after him. And he goes to uh, Gyllenhaal goes to the place where he's torturing Alex Jones because he was tailing him around there and he said, no, I just go there to drink. And he like, obviously had to like look for the kids. So he couldn't look into that. So then he assumes that like somehow the kid is there. It technically doesn't really make any sense, but he rushes there and finds Alex Jones instead. And then Hugh Jackman goes to the aunt's house And she basically confesses to the whole thing and she's like, yeah, we we like kidnap kids because God stole our kids. So we want people to feel feel like us or some shit. Totally crazy. And then she like holds him at gunpoint. So he's pretty much fucked. Um, And it's revealed that Alex is technically just like kidnapped by them. That guy that killed himself was also kidnapped by them. And then she just like leaves him in the pit. I mean, I think she was going to shoot him, but then Loki shows up. And he's just trying to be like, yo, I found Alex. Like he's just doing like following up on what he discovered And then it all connects back to, like, the mazes thing. Because the dude had mazes all over the wall. And then, like, a necklace had a maze. And then it turns out in a photo, like, her husband's necklace has the maze. And he starts running through the house. And he's a, he, he, like, right as she is poisoning Hugh Jackman's kid. And then he bangs her. Well, he shoots her with a gun, I mean, and she shoots him in the fucking head, but it's like a um, just a head wound. Like she doesn't like kill him. She aimed way too high. And then he is just driving through traffic, like going as fast as he can while the ki- hoping the kid doesn't die. But he's also passing out. And so they're both passing out, but he has blood all over his face and he's just going through traffic like 150 miles an hour. Uh, incredible stuff. He makes it. Everybody survives, and then um, they find Hugh Jackman because his daughter's whistle was at the bottom of the pit, and the movie's over, and he was blowing the whistle. Dark, crazy-ass fucking movie. Like I said, didn't I mean, Denise the man. Like, this movie's incredible, so it's not... I'm not saying, like, Fincher should have directed in this, instead because this was a failure, I just think he would be more appropriate for it. Denis crushed it. Deacons crushed it. All the performances were good. I the strong preference I would prefer still Denis Oscar Isaac over Hugh Jackman. I think this movie bumps up a letter grade. You know, I don't really like the letter grade scale. I think it goes from like a high seven to a low eight. You know, if it's a seven point eight. It's an 8.2 with Isaac. I think that's my opinion, and I'm going to stick to it. Joan Hall is incredible. Again, all the supporting people are great. The creepy the creepy ass lady who's fucking with kids. Um, all of that. Everybody's great. Viola Davis, Terrence Howard, you know, just top to bottom. Uh, it's longer than you would think, but it moves really fast. Uh, so much happens. That I, you know, there's not a part that I would really cut from it. It's all pretty necessary. Um, And just a fucking gut punch of a movie. But, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it. Now, you shouldn't watch it a lot, but you kind of could. Because it has almost like... 
since it's like a revenge thriller, there's just a lot of gratification in them winning. Um, but violent as all hell, just brutal what happens to that guy. And Dana, a little over the top, actually. He dials it up a lot, though. That's his thing. I mean, it worked really well, and there will be blood, so why why stop? Um, great flick, but then how, in the same year, right after, Hall just comes right back and does Enemy. This movie is lean, uh, shot fucking great, not Denis, great score. I'm not sure who did it. Basically, Jake Gyllenhaal plays some professor guy who lives like a mundane day-to-day whatever life. And he's, you know, stuck in the minutia. And then a co-worker of his recommends some movie to cheer him up. And he's like, I don't really watch movies, but, you know, I'll think about it. He rents the movie. And then he sees Jake Gyllenhaal in the movie. Now, not it's not literally Jake Gyllenhaal. This isn't like a meta movie, although they could have went that route and that could have been interesting. But instead, uh, this is all set in Toronto. So this movie, like I said, it was not an American-released movie. I think it went on to Netflix or something, you know? Like, it's it's been around. It's not like nobody's seen this. I'm not acting like this is some exclusive thing. Uh, I did have to rent it in this occurrence. It's not currently streaming somewhere. But what... So that was a little confusing for me at first because I was just like, oh, everybody just lives in Toronto? Why is that? And it's like, oh, well, Toronto is where they make movies in Canada, I guess. So it does add up. So anyway, he then like goes to like a bunch of lengths to like track this guy down and then he calls him and thing things get like weird. Uh the guy thinks he's just some like stalker guy and then they go and check it out. And basically they end up meeting each other in some seedy hotel room and it just gets weird as hell and then uh Professor Jake like bails and wants to leave but now actor jake is starting to get into it basically they have the opposite reactions in both cases they're basically polar opposites of each other uh professor jake's like a timid whatever guy you know a teacher again doing day-to-day things actor jake is you know like rich lives in a penthouse bosses his wife around is like a total asshole douchebag basically in every way but has like firm grasp of like taking control of things so they're both opposites one's a people pleaser and one is not um so the more the actor guy keeps kind of pushing him to like do more stuff they just keep doing it Anyway, eventually he's like, I'm going to bang your girlfriend because you fucked my wife. And he's like, he couldn't even have the balls to say, like, I didn't fuck your wife, dude. Like, what? Anyway, so they do like a swap. And then asshole actor Jake is banging his girlfriend. And then she's like, why do you have like a wedding band ring? And their bodies are like identical, though. They have the same scars. Like, they do all that stuff. They like discuss it. And then he kills her because he gets really mad and then, like, crashes the car because he's behaving erratically because basically his wife would never talk to him that way and she's used to bossing him around and she doesn't believe he's him and so they just get into a fight and then they die. Kind of of wild. The ending's a little eh. But I get it. A tough thing to resolve. But they keep it a tight 90. And then... um. The other lady who is pregnant is just like, I like this guy better. I'll just be married to you. Is that cool? And he's kind of just like, what? I don't really know. Sure, let's do it. Because he wasn't really loving his life anyway. Goes into the room to talk to her. Giant spider up against the wall. Movie ends. 
There was already some weird, bizarre stuff going on throughout it. There was allusions to spiders and certain things throughout the movie already. No resolution, really. You kind of don't really know what's going on. This, to me, is the closest thing to a David Lynch movie by someone not named David Lynch that I've seen. I've seen a few movies, you know, that don't, like, the names don't even come to mind that have been described as Lynchian. And really, there's just some visual similarities maybe here or there, or all they mean is, like, oh, there's some, like, twist um, like I think I've seen Vanilla Sky described as that, but Vanilla Sky is nonsense. It's it's not the same. Maybe it hasn't been described as that. Not the point. This just truly felt it felt the same. I don't know how else to explain it. There's a reason why Lynchian is its own term. And this truly foots the bill. I absolutely loved it. And you, it's hard to explain why, but it was just fucking great. The fact that they didn't try to, like, explain some crazy thing, like, like, oh, this was basically just Fight Club. He defeated the, the ego of himself or whatever and succeeded or something. There wasn't some, like twist revelation it's like no actually this is even more complicated than we were leading on we tried to, you thought this was going to be a movie about just two guys who look alike but then it transformed into something else completely um because yeah the guy could live technically he's dead with his girlfriend and that all makes sense and they can just call that a thing and he can just take that guy's place and nobody would ever know. But it's like, well, that would just be a bad ending to the movie. It's like, how do we flip it? And again, there was allusions to it. It's not like they thought of, you know, I'm sure this was part of the inception, the whole t- conception the whole time. Um, the only dramatic difference I would say from something Lynchian is that this is much like smoother and aesthetically pleasing visually like Denis you know it's it's shot like a Denis movie it looks fantastic and big especially for a low budget movie that this is um this looks like it could have cost five six seven times whatever it did filming in Toronto helps I'm sure also instead of like giant vibrant colors and jarring camera movements and cuts which is just a Lynch style. So he just he shot a Lynch movie in his own visual style. It's more Lynchian in the writing and concept, which is typically not the case in what I see that is labeled as such. They're just like, oh, it's black and white and there's noise. Like it's like, ah, that's not what the thing is, though. Um and David Lynch, of course, is, you know, on my Mount Rushmore, probably. Denise creeping up, but I mean, it's like Quentin PTA, David Lynch, David Fincher, Denise. Yeah, that's tough. It's tough. We're getting there with with Denise anyway. I'm just saying that that's a rough one either way. It might that might not even be the correct. You can't put me on the spot, Adam. Uh this this movie was fucking fantastic. I highly encourage anyone to watch it. 90 minutes clean. Fly, obviously flies by and you don't really know where it's leading, especially as he's investigating it starts to get more and more intense. And then by the time they meet, it does the eerie vibe just starts to come in that something just different is happening than what they're showing. Like, I don't know how to explain it, but you can just tell there's almost like a spiritualness to whatever's happening. I, I Again, hard to explain. Um, but just immaculate vibes in a great movie. Um, so check out Enemy. Fucking love Denis. What a slurp fest. 
Uh, we are out of time for draft takes. I can't do it. No, I'm going to do it. Psych. You know I'm fucking doing it, baby. We got a few minutes left here. Who gives a fuck? Let's just get it in. Caleb Williams. My newest Lord and Savior. You know, just when my heart was broken, just when I thought I couldn't fall in love again, here I am, head over heels, Caleb Williams, sweep me off my feet and take me to the promised land, baby. This is the greatest offense in Bears history already. And I previously was saying Justin Fields was the best quarterback in Bears history. Athletically, I was correct. In overall talent, I was not correct. The supporting cast, we know all the things. He didn't get the development quarterback needs. There maybe could have been a reality where he was better. But I was in love. I was still head over heels. Just the level of talent in my lifetime. Him and Cutler, that's it. And listen, Jay Cutler also never lived up to his potential. Not that Justin Fields will never. Listen, I still love the guy. I wish him the best. Anyway, Keenan Allen, Gerald Everett, Cole Komet, a guy named DJ Moore, DeAndre Swift, Coleo Herbert, fucking offensive line depth, and Darnell Wright year two. I mean, this is going to be fucking awesome. A new, experienced offensive coordinator. I know that Seattle fans had their gripes. Everyone has their gripes with their guy unless you're the fucking Chiefs, man. And that's just how it is. Compared to what we had, I'll take a competent guy who has a real offense and a feel for play calling. Now, number nine. If you can trade back... And still get that D tackle from Texas, Jared Verse, or the UCLA guy, I'm fine with it. If you want to take a tackle, I'm fine with it. If you want to take a receiver, I'm fine with it. There's rumors that Atlanta may not get the eighth pick because of tampering. If that happens, Dallas Turner, I love it. Any of the all of the options at play, I love all of them. My preference would be to not take receiver in the first round. Receivers always deep. There are always stud receivers that are drafted in the third. The, we don't have a second rounder, but second especially is a. I feel like where the the most receivers come out of that have like a long standing path in the NFL. But if they take receiver at nine, I'm gonna be fine. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm gonna be more than fine with it. I just don't think it's that necessary with the weapons we already have. Now we are lacking depth at receiver, so again, it's all good. There's, it's not a problem. I just think Braxton Jones has been very solid. But if we have like an all pro left tackle, that would be ideal, which is possibly in the cards. So if you can get an all-pro left tackle, I would take that. I would take an edge, just pass rush in general. Like I said, if they end up taking that D-tackle from Texas, that's fine. We don't have a starting D-tackle. It would just be one of the guys from last year taking on the role, which I don't know if they're ready. Uh, but if we get Dallas Turner or Verse, whatever. If those guys are supposed to be great, then that's great. Um, let, So... Round three, assuming we don't trade back and don't get anything extra. Brandon Rice. Caleb Williams' teammate at USC. Great. Check a box. Number two, son of Jerry Rice, the greatest receiver ever. Check a box. The kid has to have work ethic. I know a lot about Jerry Rice, and the man worked hard. He caught bricks as a kid. That's how he got hands. He was like seven years old catching bricks because he was working in Mississippi or Alabama or wherever he's from. Pardon me, Jerry. Okay, he was sprinting up sand hills all day, every day. That's Jerry Rice. Uh, but I'm good with whatever. Take a receiver in the third round. Whoever's available that will make an impact, I'm fine with it. Tyler Scott, I'm, I hope he can make a jump, but... 
I, whoever we draft, I assume we'll jump him, even if he's a third rounder. After that, take whatever. It, it's depth. You know, I think all we have is a, a fourth after that. Um, You know, if you want to trade that back and get two fifths, Poles likes to do stuff like that. I'm all for whatever. Just to add more depth to the roster, please do. Um... My th- I would be mad. Let's say we don't take a receiver in the first round and then Brendan Rice is there and they don't take him. Then I'm upset. That's the only thing. If Brendan Rice is there and we still haven't drafted a receiver and we take someone else, I'll be a little upset. The college teammate thing has worked recently. Uh, a lot. So that just is a thing for me. And I think it makes more sense to draft your third receiver in the third round than in the first round. You know, I think Keenan Allen will probably end up with an extension. But I get it. He won't be around for five years like a first round guy would be, most likely. That would be great if he is, but it just doesn't seem like that's going to happen either way. So... Listen, I'm thrilled for this. I will report back from D-Town, going out there, repping my guys. Uh, I'm sure things will go awry in many and amusing ways. They'll probably be incredibly frustrating in the moment. But you know what they say. You do it for the show. (laughs) That's not why I'm going, but it will make for an episode. Ladies and gentlemen, so I will be back next week with my full NFL draft report. There's a chance it comes out late, might be a Wednesday drop. I'm just throwing that out there if it happens. I'm not planning on that happening, but there is a chance that it may. So keep an eye out next week for that. We got some bangers coming up. Let me just say that. Uh, I'm not going to reveal the episode, but let's just say it will be a food movie spectacular. Uh, Nice double feature coming at you. Possibly animated? Quite possibly animated. Um, I'm trying to grow the, the list so we don't, so we, so we've got movies going forward. If you noticed, I've been a little more diligent with having some things because it has been a dreadful television season and I'm hoping that next year this will, you know, after the summer, it'll all be evened out from all the writer strike stuff because it's been bleak, ladies and germs. It's been bleak. Haven't been to the theater in a minute. Thought about seeing Civil War, just didn't really, just didn't really seem to pop out as anything like significant or necessary to see really in any way at all. So I did not. You know, when that comes to streaming, maybe, maybe we'll talk. All right. Uh, thanks for tuning in. As always, rate, review, and subscribe. To Requiem for a Tuesday. Share these episodes. Get the word out. We got to get these numbies up. A little bit of a dry spell right now. You know. All my core guys still listening. I know you are. Don't worry. I'm not upset. But we just got to get this this exponential growth going. Am I right, guys? Okay. Yeah, I've lost the energy to to do the spiel so listen to the show share the show uh tell your friends tell your mom tell your cousin whoever uh anybody like movies listen to this you like dumb fuckers listen to me you know that's that's what we tell people uh dumb fuck movie talk was the original title anyway rate review and subscribe rfat.pickcartel.com microwaveminutes.com 
Check out all the links in the description below. And remember, I are fat, you are fat, we are fat. And then I cat, 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 calc you later.